dementia is most often looked at as memory loss, memory impairment. But all irreversible dementias are not just memory impairment, and they're not just a communication issue. Dementias that are irreversible are physical conditions. While a lot of us here might know that, a lot of the families that we work with and those professionals that we might work with that are less seasoned or have less experience in our industry forget this. They think of dementia simply as a memory problem and it's a lot more complicated than that. Today we're going to talk about aggressive behavior. Aggressive behavior is one of the top problems that we have in working with a patient who has dementia. And what we're going to do is figure out why does it happen and what can we do to reduce it or what can we do to prevent it and how can we educate families about reducing and preventing it. Dementia is never normal. Never normal part of aging. There's a lot of bad information out there sometimes in pop culture. We still hear the word senility being thrown around. Dementia is never a normal part of aging. Just like having a heart attack. Is a heart attack a normal part of getting older? No. It can happen more frequently as we get older, but it's never a normal part of getting older. Having cancer is never a normal part of getting older. Is it a condition that happens more often for some cancers as we get older? Absolutely, but it's not a normal part of the aging process. So dementia in and of itself is never normal aging. There's lots of normal things that happen to us as we get older. Dementia is not one of them. Some of the changes that happen with our brains as we age include things like reflex and reaction time changes. What kinds of things, how do you see that manifest itself with your older employees, your older residents, your older family members that you work with? How do you see a reflex and reaction time slow down? What kinds of things are you seeing? Yeah, dropping things more, not being able to catch your balance. Yeah. Supporting even a little, like, hand-eye coordination problems as they bring, like, a fork of food. Absolutely. A little bit of hand-eye coordination sometimes. Another big one, what's the one everybody's thinking of? No one's said yet. Driving. Everybody knows driving. Driving is a big one with reflex and reaction time. We also have more tip of the tongue moments. You're going to have these at every age, but you're going to have even more of them as we continue to get older. And so what might be an example of a tip of the tongue moment? Uh, you know what? I saw this awesome movie last weekend. And oh, gosh, it starred Ben Affleck. It was based on a book. And then I'm driving home from this event today, and I remember what's the name of the movie? Gone girl, right? But that's a tip of the tongue moment. We all have them. We're all going to have more of those as we continue to get older. Brain size shrinks. Just like all of our organs in our body shrink, the brain shrinks. We also have an increased what we call benign senescence. And so what is an example of benign senescence? All of us have it, and all of us are going to have more of it as we age because it's a normal part of the aging process. What is benign senescence? Can someone give an example of benign senescence? It's a little bit of mild forgetfulness. Do you ever go to the mall forget where you and forget where you parked? Absolutely. So you forget where you parked. How do we combat some of this normal aging? How do you combat this, some of these normal aging things? Everybody has control. We're going to have these normal aging symptoms, but all of us can use what we call memory cues to combat these. What might be, yeah? Yeah, when you go to the grocery store and you walk out of the grocery store, you intended to buy bread, what do you walk out with? Everything, Everything but bread. Your whole shopping cart full, but no bread. So you're exactly right. If you write a list, that's going to help you. It's going to be a memory cue. Put your cell phone in the same place in your purse. Those are the kinds of things that can combat some of these normal aging symptoms. If you go to the mall, always park at Macy's. That's where my car is. That's where I know it is. Have memory cues like that. So this is the normal aging process. Uh, we have a little bit of trouble with speed and accuracy of movement as we get older. And then also, we have a little bit of a harder time on timed tests. I, 
I teach college. I have 80 year olds that take my college classes sometimes. They can learn, absolutely they can learn, and you know from your residents and patients you work with, but if you give an 80 year old a timed test and you give that same test to a 20 year old, the 20 year old, they might get the same score, the 20 year old is gonna finish faster. And that's all, we, it, we have the same ability to learn as we age, but with time test it's less. So all of these things are normal aging. You'll notice dementia is not one of them. So what is dementia? Dementia is really your umbrella term for symptoms. It's really just symptoms. Dementia really should never be your diagnosis. If you have symptoms such as problems with memory, and again, that's the one that everybody thinks of most frequently, short-term memory loss, can't remember what I had for breakfast, can't remember what day of the week it is, those types of things. But we also see, and these are the things that a lot of folks don't realize come along with a lot of irreversible dementias. Communication and language problems. So what might be an example of a communication and language problem that you have with dementia? Incomplete sentences. Or I ask you, how was your day? And you say, curtains. The response doesn't make sense. So being able to answer a question properly or being able to participate in a conversation. A lot of families do not realize this is part of an irreversible dementia. Everybody thinks it's the short-term memory. And again, a lot less seasoned staff or staff that don't have a lot of experience in older adult care with dementia, they don't realize these things also. Poor judgment, visual perception problems because of hallucinations, ability to focus and pay attention. So you might have a problem paying attention if, you're, if you are taking a class, or if you're having a conversation with your daughter, there might be a hard time following along, even if it's a conversation that you're interested in. So some specific examples. So let's say it's week, first week in December, and you can't remember what did you do for Thanksgiving last week. That's a problem. That's a symptom of dementia, potentially. Can't remember something recent. Your daughter says she's moving to Hawaii. That's something you're going to remember. That's a short-term that's a short-term memory problem. If you don't remember that your daughter just told you yesterday that she's moving to Hawaii from the East Coast. Personality changes can sometimes happen. And so one of the more common ones we see is dad's always been really gentlemanly. Now we suddenly see that dad is using really bad language in front of the grandkids. One that families can be a little bit embarrassed about is the opposite. Gosh, mom's a lot easier to deal with now. She's so pleasant. You've had that experience? And, and that's a really tough one too because families sometimes feel guilt. She's a lot more pleasant now. She's not as difficult to be around. Uh, we're not arguing as much. But personality changes can be part of an irreversible dementia. Forgetting who the president is. Now, one of the things we see a lot of retirees panic about, I don't remember what the date is. What do you think that means? And what does that mean? It means that you might not have to write down the date every day. You might, but do you know that it's what time of year it is? Do you know that it's, uh, it's middle of October? Those are the kinds of things that are really important to know. And so a, a retiree sometimes will be panicked about that. Or if, if you're on vacation or if you've been sick for a few days, you might not know the date immediately. But you're going to know who the president is. You're going to know what season it is. Those are the kinds of things that confusion, confusion about important things, getting lost, taking a walk after dinner, can't find your way back to your house. And more commonly, which concerns so many of us, is the driving. I get in my car, I intend to go to the grocery store, and I wind up on the highway, and I can't remember why I got in my car to begin with. So some, all of these things, these are much more than just short-term memory loss. A lot of people focus, well, my, my mom couldn't remember my name, or my mom couldn't remember that we went shopping yesterday. Yeah, those can be part of irreversible dementia, but all of these others are too. And these are the types of things that can sometimes lead to aggressive behavior. And we're going to spend some time talking about what we can do to prevent, what we can do to manage the aggressive behavior. Poor judgment. For example, wearing winter clothes in the summer. Now, 
the caveat is you've got to make sure it's not something that that person would have done before they had these dementia symptoms. And I'm going to give you an example. My dad is the kind of guy that's going to go to a really nice restaurant in sweatpants. That's just him. He's eccentric. He's going to say, I'm going to wear what's comfortable. And he's not trying to be rude, but that's just his style. That's not going to be a symptom for him if he had dementia symptoms. There would be other things. But you have to take into consideration what's normal for this person. And that helps us to, to figure out, does this person have symptoms that we should be concerned about or not? So all of those symptoms that we just talked about, memory, communication, judgment, confusion, visual perception, the reasoning and judgment being diminished, all of these things can be caused by something either reversible or irreversible. And obviously today we're going to focus on the irreversibles. But good clinical practice says you got to keep your eye on things that are reversible. Because if one of our patients has a reversible dementia, we certainly want to treat the cause. So the things that can cause a reversible dementia for older adults can be depression. It can be potentially a urinary tract infection can cause some of these symptoms. Uh, other things that can cause these symptoms can be uh, a stroke can cause temporary symptoms of dementia. Also, it can cause uh, irreversible symptoms of dementia. But there's lots and lots of reasons, a medication side effect, for example. Lots of reasons that we can have a reversible dementia, a dementia that we can treat. So of course, if the person has depression that's causing the dementia symptoms, we want to treat that with perhaps an antidepressant or counseling. If it's a urinary tract infection, of course, we want to use a, a, an antibiotic. Uh, if it's something that can be treated, we want to certainly treat it. And then, of course, what we want to focus on for the aggressive behavior is the irreversible dementias, the permanent dementias. So of all of the potential causes of dementia symptoms, confusion, poor judgment, getting lost in familiar places, visual perception problems, concentration problems. The most common reason that we could have these symptoms, if we've ruled out all the reversibles, is Alzheimer's disease. And that accounts for approximately 65% of all of the irreversible dementias. So there's many, many others. And I just listed a couple of up here for your reference. And Lewy body dementia, frontotemporal dementia, Parkinson's can sometimes cause dementia symptoms. creutzfeldt jakob disease can cause dementia symptoms. So there's many, many, many causes. But because Alzheimer's disease is the most common, so if I said to you, what's the most common last name in the United States? What's everybody going to say? Smith. Yeah. Alzheimer's is your Smith. It's the one that is the most common. It's the one everyone thinks of. I could ask that question a thousand times and everybody always says Smith. It's the one that, the first one that comes to mind. So Alzheimer's disease is, is your, your, your most common name that you're going to see in the irreversibles. Make sense so far? Any questions before we move on? Any questions about the dementia symptoms? about the causes, about irreversible versus reversible. Yes? Can you tell me a little bit about anxiety, the anxiety problems and how that relates to dementia? Right now I'm working with a, a patient that when I was first introduced to her, I was told that she has dementia and that you're going to see some anxiety. And at first I was like, whenever I would meet her, I was just always focused on where's the anxiety, where's the anxiety, and I wasn't seeing any of it until we started working on some of her problems. And then repeatedly she'd be coming back to my office asking about the same thing again and again, and I never picked up that, okay, that's the anxiety that I was warned about in the beginning. Okay, great question. So the question is, somebody who has dementia, an irreversible dementia, is often going to have anxiety symptoms. Is, is that a good summary for your question? Yeah. Okay. Why, does that why do people have anxiety symptoms? Why, why do you suppose people have anxiety symptoms when they have an irreversible dementia? It's very common. What's that? Fear, yeah, because they're they're unfamiliar. So, if 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 a patient with Alzheimer's disease is sitting with their their spouse, their daughter, people they know very well, and they don't recognize them, and if they're at their home and they don't recognize it as familiar, it's scary. 
it, it all, the whole world appears new to somebody with dementia. The person does not feel comfortable a lot of times, and so there's going to be anxiety symptoms. People with, a lot, with, anxiety, with uh, Alzheimer's disease and other irreversibles often need a lot of reassurance that everything is okay. And so a lot of those symptoms come from disorientation. They can't remember, not only can they not remember where they are, uh, they might not remember the name of their dog. They might be sitting next to their husband and not recognize his face. That makes people very anxious and very nervous. And that can actually, it's a great question because that's gonna segue in a little while to why we have aggressive behavior sometimes with, with Alzheimer's disease and dementia. And anxiety can absolutely be a reason that people become aggressive. Uh, why? A couple reasons. One, we don't handle their anxiety symptoms great. If we're not handling the symptoms well, sometimes it, it can escalate to be really aggressive. Uh, so there's other reasons, but we'll, and we'll get to those in a little while. Any other questions before we move on? Yes? CJD is Creutzfeldt Jakob disease, and it is a type, a, a cause of irreversible dementia. And it's actually a short term. The condition typically lasts only about one year. It's just one cause. I just wanted to give you some examples of other reasons that you can have these symptoms that it's irreversible. Okay, thank you. Yeah. Great question. Uh, is a diagnosis of Parkinson's automatically a dementia diagnosis? Absolutely not. Some people with, you see Michael J. Fox does not have dementia symptoms. There's many people who have Parkinson's disease, they do not, but there are many people who have Parkinson's that that is, a, that is the cause of their dementia symptoms. So great question and you're absolutely right, no, not everybody with Parkinson's has dementia symptoms. Any other questions before we move on? Alzheimer's type of dementia permanent, and it is the sixth leading cause of death in the United States. Six leading cause of death in the United States. We don't have a cure. We don't have a remission. We don't have anything that slows it down. We have meds that can help with symptoms, but it doesn't slow it down. We don't have anything that we know for sure prevents it. So Alzheimer's disease is a very serious condition. And again, this is why it's so important to remember it's not just about memory. It is a physical condition. Alzheimer's disease, from the first day that we show symptoms of Alzheimer's until the day that we pass away, and by the way, on average, the person with Alzheimer's disease lasts roughly eight years. The latest data is telling us the trajectory is approximately eight years. The person's memory, yeah, for Alzheimer's disease, typically the memory problem is the first issue, but we see things like word finding. We see things like not properly being able to respond to a question. We see things eventually not able to dress yourself, incontinence. Uh, eventually the person's unable to swallow. It is a physical condition in addition to a cognitive condition. And people do pass away from Alzheimer's disease, six leading cause of death in the United States. No cure, no remission, nothing to slow it down, and nothing that we know for sure that prevents it. And that's why research is so important. Courtesy of the Alzheimer's Association, we have here an advanced Alzheimer's brain and we have a healthy brain. And a lot of families really need to see a visual. Because especially when someone's in the early stages of Alzheimer's, they look and sound like us. Now their memory might be not what it used to be, but it's at the point where she's still dressing the way she's always dressed, and she's still able to carry on a conversation for the most part. She might forget my name sometimes. A lot of families, they don't see that it's a really a, a disease, the condition. We sometimes see families berating a loved one. I know that she would remember my name if she really wanted to. You know what, she always remembers my sister's name. She was always the favorite. So families, a lot of times, they, they don't necessarily accept the condition, especially when the person looks and sounds like us for the most part. And again, the early stage of the disease can last a while. It can last a couple of years where the person looks and sounds like us. They just have mild forgetfulness. They're getting lost in familiar places. They've got a little poor judgment going on. 
So sometimes it can be really helpful to show people a visual. For example, if I was wearing a cast right now on my leg, would you say, hey, Jennifer, you want to go running after the program? No, right. You're not going to say that. You're going to say, oh, you're think, you might think, oh, you know, I'm going to go ask her to go running. And, oh, you know, she's got a cast on her leg. She can't. Well, that kind of visual is not there for Alzheimer's disease. And so it sometimes can be really important to show a picture. And a little bit later in the program, we're going to look at a video that actually gets into a little bit more specifics. But for some families, this can break them out of that denial. One of the reasons that families struggle with aggressive behavior with their loved one who has Alzheimer's, and also, again, folks who don't have a lot of experience professionally, is because they think the person can help it. They think of it as simply a memory problem. That there shouldn't be aggressive behavior. It's just, you know, she, she forgets the name of her daughter. She forgets where she is. They can accept that part of it. I think that we've done, a, in public health, we've done a really good job of getting that word out that memory is a big part of Alzheimer's disease, but the rest of it, people struggle with sometimes. Uh, we've known about Alzheimer's disease for well over uh, 100 years, and Dr. Alzheimer uh, discovered that in 1906, and the first patient, believe it or not, was actually somebody who was a young onset type, which, who was in their early 50s. Most of the time, however, we see people diagnosed after 75. So the big risk factors for Alzheimer's, just to recap, getting older, heart disease, head injury. This is why we see NFL is starting to put some money toward brain research. Uh, we see boxers and football players. It's, if you've had a concussion, if you've been in a coma, those are, are major risk factors. And then the other major risk factor is family history. And we all know you can't do anything about your family history. If you want to or not, you're stuck with whatever genetics you've got. These are the four major risk factors for Alzheimer's disease. Of course, there's new studies out every day. Uh, there's a recent study that talks about long-term use of benzodiazepines as being a risk factor. But as far as the big four, this is where they are. Family history, head injury, getting older, heart disease. So the stages, and what we're going to talk about now is where we are in terms of the stages. So on average, Alzheimer's disease is roughly eight years. So there's not really an exact trajectory that you're in early stages for two years, you're in middle stages for three years. It doesn't work like that. Some people are longer period in the early stages. Some people have a longer period in mid and late. But what I want to ask you, while you're looking at some of these symptoms, what are the opportunities for the patient to become aggressive with what they're dealing with in each stage? Also like to remind you that there are scales that show Alzheimer's disease as having seven stages. Uh, I think it is more helpful to show families the three stages because they don't get so wrapped up in precisely what stage is this person in right now. The early stages, we see a lot of communication challenges. We see things uh, from the day one of the person being diagnosed with Alzheimer's disease until the person passes away. Their communication skills are going downhill. Their ability to understand you is going down, and our ability to understand them is going down. So the communication constant challenges, word finding. Not tip of the tongue moment, but word finding. So what might be an example of word finding? Problem with word finding. Yeah. Like if, um, if you're, I'm thinking of like my, the way my, my grandmother was, she had um, dementia for four years before she passed away. If you're seeing the nursing home with her, trying to like bring in her menu, and like my mom would say to her, okay, mom, what would you like for breakfast? And she'd be like, oh, do you know, you know, I want the. Yeah, really great, great example. Oh. Thank you for sharing that. So that a basic, uh, she'll say, you know, she'll, she'll start using gesturing. Uh, her mother would try to plan the menu with her grandmother, and she would say, you know, I want that, and, and start gesturing. And that's a lot of what we start to see, not being able to figure out how to say, I'd like toast, uh, but, but trying to, to find the words. You're having trouble with that, and that happens very frequently. And again, I don't, I don't want to scare anybody because we all have tip of the tongue moments where we, we you know, you might be sitting here. 
right? We all have tip of the tongue moments. You might be sitting here and you're looking around and there's somebody in this room that you know you know. And you've, you've met them a million times and you can't remember their name. But you're going to drive away later and maybe it'll come to you or maybe it won't. That is not dementia. All of us can, can get out the word for, I want to get more coffee, I want to go to the bathroom. Those are the types of things that we're talking about that the person's unable to express. Patient has an awareness that something's wrong. And my, my personal experience with working with this disease is, I believe that this has to be the hardest part for the patient. Not necessarily for the family, but for the patient. They have an awareness, they know something's off, things aren't quite right. We also see a lot of getting lost. We see that the beginning of the poor judgment. For, again, for some people, you're going to see things like somebody that was always great at keeping their checkbook. Maybe they, have, they were a bookkeeper, for example. And now suddenly, they can't write a simple check. That would be a symptom for some people. For others, now there might be people in here that say, oh gosh, I'm terrible with my checkbook. That might not be a symptom for some people. How about somebody who's a great cook? and suddenly they can't follow a basic recipe. That might be a symptom for them. So where are the opportunities for aggression here? Why would somebody with Alzheimer's act out aggressively at this point? Frustration. 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 They're frustrated with themselves, and they're often gonna be frustrated with us. They're gonna be frustrated with us because we are not able to fill in the blank for them. We don't know what they're trying to say. What might be other opportunities for aggressive behavior? Yes, when we are impatient with them. Because one of the keys is being patient, which is really hard, especially in our fast-paced world. We, we, we're not as patient as we might like to be sometimes with somebody with dementia, especially in the early stages when we don't recognize it as such before someone's had a proper diagnosis. So what kinds of things might you see happening as a result of frustration, as a result of we aren't as patient as we should be with this person? How might the person act out aggressively? Yes. An anger flare-up, and what might that look like, an anger flare-up? What might an anger flare-up look like? Well, I think it depends on the individual. It does depend on the individual, but, but what might an anger flare-up look like? We've all seen it. If you've ever worked with a client with dementia, you've seen it, yeah. It usually is. You know what I'm talking about. Why, why, why are you doing that? Yeah, <laughs> you know what I'm talking about. Somehow they can get that out. Sometimes they can get out a phrase of frustration toward you. That's what's so difficult about dementia. They can't get out the name that they want toast, but they can get out, you know what I'm talking about, you know what I mean. And so they, an anger flare-up might be they yell at you, or they're really short-tempered with you. That, that could be, a, that's a sign of a, a little bit of aggressive behavior to that person. What else? Yeah. Sometimes you'll see where they have an increased appetite they're not eating because they can't tell you what they want and somebody's always choosing something for them. You, I don't want oatmeal every day, so guess what? I'm Okay, so another example of aggressive behavior might be somebody is hungry, but they're not able to say what they want to eat, or that they, they might not even be able to articulate that they're hungry. Think about all the steps. All of us in this room, if you're hungry, you're going to go in the other room, and you're going to go ahead and get some more of the fruit, get some more of the breakfast. We, think about all the steps that that takes in your brain to do, though. In the early stages, start, that's starting to become compromised. And so if we put, like you said, a plate of fruit, an oatmeal, a piece of toast in front of them, they might act out aggressively by not eating it in a passive aggressive way. Or they might push it away from you or walk away or huff and puff and walk away. There's so many different ways that, that they're trying to tell you, I don't like this. Yes. Right. They don't have the words, so they just push you out of the yep. way, but knock you out. Right. So in the early stages, if you're trying to get your loved one or your patient to, it's time for us to get in the car and go to the doctor, and they don't want to, they might push you away. So they're aggressive in that way. So we see a lot of, of 
phys it can be physically aggressive, it can be verbally aggressive, and also, like you said, it can be passive aggressive. Yes? Yeah. Of course not. We're talking, like you're saying, we're talking about independent grown-ups. These are adults that are in their 60s, 70s, 80s, and beyond. There are grown-ups, they're adults, they've lived a whole independent life, and now we're trying to cue them, we're trying to help them, and they need it, but it's very frustrating. So of course they're gonna be aggressive with us sometimes. That's, that's gonna be their way to communicate. Now I'm gonna use this analogy several times today, and I wanna be clear what I mean with it. The older person with Alzheimer's disease or another form of irreversible dementia is an adult. They are a grown-up. However, many of their ways of communicating and many of their behaviors are going to be childlike at times because that's what they have at their disposal. They have childlike ways of communicating at their disposal because their brain is not working the way a grown-ups normally would. Their brain is being attacked by a vicious disease. So we're gonna, when you think about the aggressive behavior that a patient with dementia exhibits, you gotta take a step back and sometimes think, yes, the person's an adult, but what would a small child who is hungry do in this situation? What would a small child do if they didn't have the words to tell me that they were angry, to tell me that they were frustrated? What would they do? How would they behave? And a lot of it's going to be verbal, physical, passive aggressive behavior. Yeah, it could be something that we would consider a temper tantrum, but it's simply that patient's way of communicating. Yeah, yes, in the back. You Yeah. Yeah, sometimes we do. And and that Again, not everybody with dementia exhibits aggressive behavior, but when they do, we sure do remember it, don't we? we? And it's on our minds because we think, gosh, how do we handle it? But you're absolutely right. Sometimes people simply withdraw. Sim they don't engage anymore when they are frustrated, when they're angry, when we're not being patient with them. It's one reaction, but, but some people do become aggressive on the other hand. Absolutely. And all of a sudden the person is, is having demands put on them that are challenged when we as caretakers have been watching and letting them kind of go. The caregiver, the professional, you may be watching this person decrease in their abilities. But in that moment, the person with Alzheimer's disease, we very much believe that that person's living in the moment. And so they might not remember that you know, this has been a slow decline. And that, yes, you, maybe today, and that's the funny thing about Alzheimer's. Today, you might not need my help picking out what you want to eat. You did yesterday. So I'm assuming today you're gonna need my help ordering off the menu or getting out of your chair. But again, there, the way that Alzheimer's disease, the trajectory goes, there's days and moments where you are better. You, you do better. You're able to function a little bit more like you used to be. But you're right, the caregiver gets to a point, okay, here's where we are. This is what we need to do in order to help our loved one, but the patient doesn't realize that they've necessarily been declining that far, and that does happen. You're absolutely right. Middle stages. So again, on average, Alzheimer's disease lasts approximately eight years, from the beginning of symptoms showing until the person passes away. Mid-stage includes things a lot more commonly like wandering. And we talked about in the early stages that we have situations where the person you know, goes out for a walk after dinner and they can't find exactly which house is theirs. But what we see more frequently in the mid-stages is things like what? What are they focused on when they wander? I want to go home. I want to go home. Now, it doesn't necessarily matter. They could be in the home that they have lived in for their entire life. Let's say that she's lived in this house for 50 years. They bought it when they first got married. And she still doesn't think she's home. 
she may be thinking of her childhood home as home. She also might be thinking, I have to pick up my kids. For a lot of people in the generations we're serving, that's a common one that females say. A common one that males in the generations we're currently serving is what? Got to go to work. Got to go to work. So they're focused a lot of times on going somewhere. They need to be somewhere. They feel a sense of urgency and they're concerned. And so if we get in their way, so we know, you know what, you haven't worked in 15 years. You're retired. You know what? Your kids do not need to be picked up. I'm your kid, right? And, and you know, I'm 40-something, I'm right? So it's, it's one of those things that, that people a lot of times really struggle with because they try to reason with the person and they try to get in their way. Dad, you don't need to go to work. Uh, you're, you're, you've retired. Don't you remember? You were, you were an engineer. You've retired a long time ago. Remember? Remember we had that big party? They try to reason with that person. That can lead to aggressive behavior. Why is that going to lead to aggressive behavior potentially? Not always, but a lot of times it will when we try to reason with them. There is nothing that we can say that's going to convince them that they don't have to go to work. So if I said to you, now we are in the end of October. If I said to you, you know what, I cannot wait for this weekend, the 4th of July fireworks. Are you, if I have Alzheimer's disease, are you gonna be able to convince me that there's no fireworks this weekend? No, you're just not, you can't reason with me. Just like if I told you that today was Friday, is there anything I can do to convince you that it is? We, you hope it is, it's not, it's Thursday. <laughs> but, but if I'm convinced that it's Friday and you're trying to convince me that it's not, why are we gonna do it? If I have that belief and I'm not somebody that you can reason with because my brain is really deteriorating. It's just like if I had a cast on my leg, you're not going to say, of course you can go running this weekend. No, I can't. I have a cast on my leg. My brain is broken. My brain is broken. My brain can't think like yours, and so I can't be reasoned with. I can't be told that my kids are in their 40s. I don't believe you. It doesn't matter how many times you repeat it. Now, that's for the mid-stages. In the early stages, however, and we'll talk a little bit about this as we progress today, in the early stages, we can try a little bit of reasoning in the early stages because sometimes that, a lot of times that person is still with us in the present moment enough that we can reason with them. The rule of thumb is if you try reasoning with somebody, do it once. Don't keep doing it. If it doesn't work, just because you raise your voice, just because you keep saying it over and over again that it's not the 4th of July, does not mean that they're gonna get it. So this is an opportunity for aggressive behavior. So if we say, Dad, you don't have to work today, and we keep repeating, and we keep repeating, and we keep repeating, how's Dad gonna respond? He's gonna get mad. He's not gonna believe you. And so what happens when we agitate somebody like that? What's the natural response? Aggression, of course, starts verbally, often escalates to physical. And this happens with people that have never been violent before. Never been violent. Now, somebody who has never had hit somebody before, somebody who's always been very kind, very gentle, very uh, courteous, it can escalate to physical violence. Now, one of the most common questions that I am asked by families, and I bet a lot of you are asked this as well, how do we prevent the hitting? How do we prevent somebody from, from screaming? It's not as complicated as a lot of us may make it out to be. It's a matter of being where they are. It's a matter of reducing our expectations, and we'll, we'll get to those strategies in a few moments. Hallucinations and delusions begin at this point more often. So the hallucinations and delusions that I believe you're stealing from my purse. What's the right answer? I'm not stealing from her, but should I be saying, no, no, I'm not stealing from you. You're not going to convince her. Reasoning does not work, and that's going to potentially lead to aggression. You're cheating on me. That's another common one. 
very common one, older adults feel that their spouse, their partner, their boyfriend, their girlfriend is cheating. There's a lot of delusions of, uh, and paranoia that goes. They see something that's not there. They hear something that's not there. More frequently, it's seeing something that's not there. They're seeing a, a burglar in their bedroom. And if we try to say, no, no, no burglar, oftentimes we're going to get aggressive behavior. Because can you imagine, try to imagine for a moment, that you actually see a burglar in your house. And you're terrified. And you call the police, and the police come, and they say, there's no burglar here. And you're, no, no, right there. The burglar's right there. Would, would you not lose your temper? You see a burglar. It doesn't matter that we don't see it, they see it. So reasoning with them is, is going to lead oftentimes to aggressive behavior. And so again, the communication challenges continue to get worse. They're having a harder time understanding us, we're having a harder time understanding them, and that leads to confusion. That leads to potentially aggressive behavior. Or like you said, it can lead to withdrawal for some people, but for a lot of people, a lot of families think, because mid-stage actually is when a lot of people are getting the diagnosis. We want people to get diagnosed in the early stages because for a variety of reasons. We want them to get on medicine. We want them to consider uh, putting together their will, changing their wills if they want to, or updating their advanced directives. But a lot of people, they wait and wait, and they don't get diagnosed until mid-stages. And so if you're in the mid-stages of Alzheimer's disease, uh, somebody is going to be having a hard time talking to you about things that, that are important. Getting your advanced directives updated. I might say, you know, mom, do, do you want to be resuscitated? Would you ever want to be on a feeding tube? She doesn't really know what she's, she, and in, in this stage, they're trying to assimilate. They're trying to answer you, but they might not understand the question. They might just start saying yes or no. And so if we prompt them for more information, sometimes we can get a, an aggressive response. Mom, would you want a feeding tube? Yes. And you think, you know, I don't think she would because all of her past discussions that we've had, she's, I don't think she would. Mom, do you understand what a feeding tube means? Yes. Well, okay, let me explain it to you. Under what circumstances would you want a feeding tube? And now she just says yes. And we start to ask more questions. We have good intentions. We're trying to help this patient. We want to do what she wants, but it's going to lots of times lead to aggressive behavior. The late stages probably are the hardest for the families. Families, more often than not, in my experience, and I'm sure a lot of people have had a similar experience, the late stages really sneak up on the family. People are not, they don't realize their loved one is gonna die from this condition. So when the person starts to become more bedbound, they're not really able to do many of their activities of daily living like bathe, dress. When they're really not eating a whole lot, when they're starting to struggle with remembering to go to the bathroom and they're starting to have more accidents, this, a lot of families find this really stressful because they didn't realize how much was going to change in the physical condition. Remember, a lot of families really genuinely look at this as a cognitive problem, as a memory problem. They don't look at it as there's going to be incontinence or this person's not going to be able to swallow. Uh, but bodily functions, we really start to have less control over those. The hallucinations get worse. And even if we do have any verbal abilities left, to add insult to injury, a lot of us start speaking a different language, literally. So if you grew up in a home where everyone spoke Russian, you might now be speaking Russian. If you emigrated from Spain, you might be speaking Spanish. Recently worked with a patient whose family was from uh, Korea, and she was struggling with, in the, late, the mid to late stages, the staff were struggling understanding her because she was speaking Korean, because that's her native language, it was in her long-term memory. And they were waiting and waiting for the son, or the grandson, the grandson to come because he spoke fluent Korean and he came in and of course, what do you think was going on? It didn't make any sense in Korean either. So yeah, it didn't make any sense in Korean either. So even if we do know the language to add insult to injury, it's still hard to understand. So the understanding is constantly going downhill in both directions. So these, where are the opportunities? There's so much opportunity for aggression here in this late stage. 
What, what, what kinds of things are going to cause somebody to become aggressive? Yeah? I guess the frustration that they feel like they're making sense, but, but you're not understanding what they're doing. Yeah, very good. They feel, the person feels like they're making sense, but you're just not getting it. They, they feel like they're, they're saying something and you just don't understand them. Yes? Pain. Yeah. And Great. Able to express it, so you have to learn about the nonverbal. People who have Alzheimer's disease absolutely feel pain just like anybody else. They just can't tell us. So how might they act out aggressively? Not being angry. Well, that would be not so aggressive. But that would be a way to tell us they're in pain, rubbing the area that hurts, rubbing their head. Yeah. Yeah, they might fight back if, if, if they have, if their arm is in pain, if their arm aches because of arthritis, they might pull back their arm, jerk back their arm, because, and that's considered to be aggressive. We, we have a lot of staff and families that say, oh, she pulled away from me. Why, you know, bath time is so hard. She might be in pain. What other aggressive behavior might occur? Punching, biting. Punching, biting, spitting. Because she's trying to get you away from hurting her arm. Screaming out, crying, aggressive behavior. Again, going back to the analogy, this is an adult, this is a grown up, but this is a person who can't communicate like a grown up anymore. They're using strategies that oftentimes a small child or a baby might use because that's all they've got left. They don't have the whole vocabulary that we do. We take for granted that if we want to communicate something, we have so many options on how to do it. How, what are our options? You want to tell somebody something, how can you, what, what are your choices? Texting. Texting, yes. Texting is a real popular one now. Email. Email. Phone call. Talk to them in person. Skype. We've got, write a letter. Can you imagine that? But, but we, we have all these options, and we don't think about it really like that. We just, we just say, oh, how do I want to communicate my message? I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to pick up the phone. I'm going to write a note. The person with dementia has very few options. So when they have very little words left, what they're going to do is they might throw something. They might yell out. They might call out. They might withdraw. They might jerk their arm away. Let's use an example of a headache. If you have a headache, what are your choices? Medication. Take medication. You're, yeah, that's where I am. Yeah. Give me an Advil, give me an aspirin, give me a Tylenol. Yep. What are the other options that you have? Yes. Lie down in a dark room. Lie down in a dark room. The holistic approach. Very nice. Yeah, take a, take a rest. What else? Get a massage. Get a massage. Very good. Yeah, just keep, ignore it, keep going on with your day. I have a headache, I'll get through the day. Let's use the example of taking a, a, a medicine to, to deal with the headache symptoms. Think about all the steps that you have to take in order to take the medicine. We don't think about it, because you either have a, one, a, a Tylenol, an aspirin, an Advil, you have one in your purse, you have one in the medicine cabinet, you're gonna get up, <coughs> Go get the medicine, go get a glass of water, you're going to take it. Let's say it's in a medicine cabinet. Remember, in the late stages, your legs don't work the way they used to. We don't think twice about standing up, getting up, walking to the medicine cabinet, opening the medicine cabinet, opening up the pill bottle, knowing that I need a glass of water to swallow the pills, putting the medicine away, knowing that, oh, it's probably going to take 20 minutes for this to kick in. All of those steps, they don't have that anymore. That's a lot of steps to go through to treat the headache. And so instead, or they might not know, you know what, taking a nice rest in a dark room, that might really be the trick. Or you know what, I'm going to ask for a massage. They don't remember that these might be things that are going to help. And so what we're going to do instead is we're going to yell. We're just going to start shouting because I'm in pain. My head hurts. Or I'm going to start just crying. Or I'm going to, maybe I do remember that medicine can help with my headache, so I'm trying to get out the front door because I think I need to go to the pharmacy and buy it. 
so there's so many different ways. So I'm, we look at it, oh, she's wandering, but she's trying to meet a need. So what we want to transition is to look at aggressive behavior as their way of communicating with us. When someone is acting out aggressively, they're trying to tell us something because they don't have the same options that all of us are so fortunate to have. They don't have the options of making decisions on their own and being completely self-sufficient and independent. They're gonna make noise, they're gonna throw something, they're gonna start crying, they're gonna shout out, they're gonna hit. Those are the things they're gonna do to tell you what they need tell you what they want, tell you how they're feeling. Comments, questions, examples, anybody would like to share? Yes. That's right. That's exactly right. So the example is that a staff, that, that you've got a resident who paces, just paces when she has to use the restroom, knowing that individual patient is going to make the difference. When she paces, we take her to the bathroom, we're getting her needs met. If we didn't anticipate, it could get worse. It could get more aggressive. She could really become more aggressive if we didn't know that about her. But what we want to be doing, of course, is trying to figure out what are they trying to tell us. And sometimes it takes a while of knowing somebody to figure out what are they trying to tell us. Questions, examples, any? Yeah? It could also be fear because they don't understand what you're doing. Yeah, it could be fear. It could be fear. They don't understand. Why are you coming to take my hand? I don't recognize you. Why are you taking me into the bathroom? Did you ever, people get so stressed about bath time in healthcare with somebody with dementia. I think a lot of us psych ourselves out a little bit because we tense up before we take someone to the bath. And think about it, is it normal? Does it make sense to the patient that there's another adult going into the bathroom with them while they disrobe? and they get into the bath or the shower, it feels totally unnatural. And so, yeah, you're absolutely right. It's, it's, it's unfamiliar. They don't know what you're trying to do. Are you trying to assault them? You know, there's a lot of things that could be going on in that patient's head. There's a fear. Yes? I actually had a good experience with this. The other day, I, was, I had to take a, a client of mine to the food stamps office, and as I'm sure everyone knows, we got there at 10 o'clock. We did not get seen and answers until 12.30, so I was there for more than two hours with her, and at the end of the last meeting, she said to me, like, I have to use the bathroom, and I'm dealing with an older elderly lady, and I have to tell her, oh, well, let's just face the bus, we'll, we'll handle it when we get back to the center, so I, I've got no training in that. I had to say to her, well, are you okay with, with me paging you? And at first, she looked a little bit upset about that, and I said, I said, um, I, I, I won't look like I'll be respectful, and then she, she was like, oh, okay, that's fine, so I just simply took her into the restroom, from a handicap stall, all I had to do simply say to her, do you need my assistance? Like, I was sure she needed to put her hands up and down or whatnot, and she said, no, I'm fine. So I was just respectful to, like, look the other way. Absolutely. And, it was fine. And, it, and this is somebody that has early stages of dementia? I'm not sure what, where, where, her, where her stage is, but she's so in her late 80s. The so example you know. is that the patient was out and she needed to use the restroom and she was actually able to articulate that she had to go to the bathroom. So we're, we're thinking she's probably in the earlier stages, possibly the, the early mid stages or, the, the, or, or simply the early stages. And if she's able to articulate, you're just showing respect. You're cueing her. You're taking her to the bathroom. You're, you're setting her up. Sometimes it's just we set them up on the toilet with the toilet paper. So it's, again, it's, it's being what they need at the time that they need it and giving them what we don't want to do and what you didn't do, which is great, is you didn't overdo it. You didn't sit there with her when she didn't need you to. So that's a great example. Okay, so the four A's of Alzheimer's disease, again, everybody knows about amnesia. Everybody expects amnesia. Everybody thinks of irreversible dementia, like Alzheimer's disease, to be memory loss, short-term memory loss. Most people get that there's a short-term memory loss component. We also have apraxia, and that's the part that a lot of people don't get. That part that I can't get to the medicine cabinet. I can't get myself to the bathroom. 
I can't pick up this glass. We don't think twice about those things, but that, if you're not able to pick up a glass or get yourself to the bathroom, that would be symptoms of apraxia, and these are big, big parts of Alzheimer's disease. Um, aphasia, of course, is having a conversation. One of the biggest mistakes that we see families, as well as sometimes even professionals make, is I'm going to go visit my loved one in the assisted living. I'm going to sit down with her and I'm going to say, Mom, how was your day? And she's got mid-stage Alzheimer's disease and she's aphasic. And what might she respond if I say, Mom, how was your day? Or I say, Mom, you're not going to believe it, but Joey made the soccer team and he's, he's starting and things are going great and, and Mary, she's doing great in school, she's getting all straight A's so far. And she says, birthday party. She says something that makes no sense. And so family gets so frustrated, they say, I don't know why I bother visiting. I don't know, I don't understand, I can't talk to her. She used to love hearing about the grandchildren. And now she's, or I say, mom, how was your day? And she says, pizza. I didn't ask you what you had for lunch, mom. I said, how was your day? And they don't understand. They get the short-term memory loss a lot of times. That gets through. But the aphasia, it's, not, it's you know what, she's doing this because she's mad that I haven't visited in two weeks. That's why she's doing it. They, they make, sometimes they make up reasons in their head because they don't really understand the disease. They, they don't understand that aphasia is a true part of Alzheimer's disease and many other irreversible dementias as well. And then of course we have the agnosia and the agnosia is you're, you're not able to respond to internal and external cues. So the internal being, I don't realize I have to go to the bathroom. And so that, again, more often in the mid to late stages. And we also have the uh, external agnosia which I know that I know you, you're familiar to me, but I think you're my sister, not my daughter. And so we see people get really frustrated sometimes with that. Well, I know that her short-term memory, memory is bad, but she should know me. I mean, I'm her daughter. Well, she might be expecting her daughter to be 10 years old because she's living in her long-term memory. She's living in her long-term memory. Keep in mind, a lot of times families struggle with the rest of the age besides amnesia. They don't realize all this. They consider Alzheimer's and irreversible dementias to be a cognitive short-term memory loss issue. They don't realize all the other stuff is going on. So the stages of the other dementias, we can see aggressive, just like with Lewy body, with dementia related to Parkinson's, with creutzfeldt jakob disease, we can see aggressive behavior at all of those stages as well. We're not going to get into too much detail about those right now. We're going to continue talking specifically about Alzheimer's because it's the most common form. So we talked about some of the examples of verbal aggressive behavior, and it can be screaming, and it can be crying, and it be cursing. We have a lot of cursing with Alzheimer's, don't we? When somebody doesn't like something, and this shocks the heck out of people. Uh, my dad has never, he's very religious. He would never say that. And they say stuff that just horrifies staff and family. But this is part of verbal aggression. It's a way that they're expressing themselves. So the most common form of aggression is verbal. Physical, pushing something away, hitting, spitting, biting, another way to express yourself. The person who's being physically aggressive is not doing it on purpose. Most people who exhibit physical aggression in later stages of dementia, mid to late stages, it's not that they're a violent person. It's not that this is the way that they typically express themselves. It's that this is how they're trying to tell us something. They're trying to tell us they have a headache. They're trying to tell us, I want to be left alone. They're trying to tell you that they're hungry. That's how they're expressing themselves. And let's not forget sexual aggression. Now, most studies indicate that sexual aggression only occurs roughly 15% of all patients. But when it happens, we sure do remember it, don't we? If you've walked in on a resident masturbating in the dining room, you remember it. If you walk in on two residents who have dementia engaging in sexual activity, you remember it. 
But it also can include things simply just touching private parts of the body in public areas, not realizing, just simply disrobing, taking off your clothes. I can all but guarantee, Janet made the very lovely statement in the beginning, if anybody has trouble with the temperature in here, speak to her, she'll try to get it where you want it to be. I can all but guarantee, I don't care if it's 100 degrees in this room, nobody here is going to disrobe. <laughs> I've never had an audience prove me wrong. <laughs> but, because why? Because you have options. Because if it's 100 degrees and you are sweating, you would say what? What would you choose to do rather than disrobe? You might go outside. You might take off a layer, take off a jacket or a sweater. What else might you do? Ask, so ask, hey, Janet, can you turn the air conditioner up? I'm, right, say, I'm dying. It's too hot in here. Start fanning yourself. You might go into the bathroom and splash water on your face. You might drink some water. Or you might say, you know what, I don't, I, I don't need to hear the rest of this. I'm getting out of here. So you have choices. Somebody with Alzheimer's disease, they don't think about those options. They just think, I'm hot. But this is often looked at as sexual aggression, sexual acting out. Oh my gosh, she's taking off her clothes. What the heck is going on? We, we get all kinds of psych consults and, um, she's hot, she's itchy, <laughs> right? I mean, it's not a psychiatric matter necessarily. It could be simply that she's trying to meet a need. If you see somebody, let's say you're single, and you see somebody that you think is attractive, and you're thinking, I like the way that person looks. <laughs> are you gonna just, it, it, let's say it's at this seminar, or, or you go back to your office, are you gonna just walk up to them and kiss them? <coughs> well, but our society says, no, you're probably not gonna do that. You're probably not going to do that. You're probably going to use other ways to let them know that you're, attra you're attracted to them. The person with dementia might just go up to you and kiss you, or might just go up to you and touch your private, private parts, or might start hugging you and putting their arms around you, because they're trying to tell you they're attracted to you, they need comfort, they want companionship. So this sexual acting out, it's, again, most of the people that behave in this way, it's not that they were a sex offender before, it's not that they were a sex offender before they had Alzheimer's disease, it's not that they have some kind of sexual problem, it's an impulse control issue. The inner monologue, we all have an inner monologue in our brain that says, you know what, yes, I think that person's hot, but I don't know their, yeah, <laughs> I'm married, right. I think they're hot, but I'm married. Exactly, yeah. But you have that inner monologue that says, hey, this isn't the best idea, or you know what, I'm gonna handle it in a different way. The person with dementia, that's constantly going downhill. And that's another thing that a lot of families don't realize. I know that mom can't remember that it's fall. I know that she doesn't remember what year it is. But surely she knows it's not appropriate to, to, to touch her breasts in the dining room in front of all these men. No, she may not. She may not. It feels good to her at that time. What's that? So maybe she did when she was 14. She, she know. You, and that's, you know, you make such a good point. She may have, it, it is possible that she may have acted like that when she were younger. It's, that's possible. But we know adult children, they think they know everything about their parents, don't they? A lot of times. Do your kids know everything about you? No. And spouses even. Spouses, you know, your spouse, most of the time, they didn't know you when you were 12 years old, except in really rare circumstances. So it might be, again, not necessarily the sexual acting out, but there could be things that, that the person is talking about or thinking about or acting like that were something that they might have done when they were younger. But most sexual acting out, we overreact to it. We overreact to it. And some of it, what we categorize as sexual acting out, like disrobing, is often just trying to meet a need. I'm hot, I have to go to the bathroom, the clothes that you put me in are itchy, I don't like them, things like that. The it, these are tight, I've gained a couple pounds, things like that. Why does aggressive behavior happen? 
The disease, the way the disease impacts the brain causes aggressive behavior sometimes. For example, if I see a burglar in my apartment, I am going to freak out if you don't believe me. So that's the hallucination is causing the aggressive behavior. Or if I see that I think there's a tiger outside and I might start throwing things at it. I might start throwing things at the window because I think I see a tiger because I'm trying to get it away from me. That's the way disease is impacting the brain. It's a hallucination. But a lot of it is the way we respond. A lot of it is the professional and or the family's responsibility that we're not handling the aggressive behavior quite the way that we should. That we could be doing a better job of handling the aggressive behavior. Or, better yet, preventing the aggressive behavior. Pa patient's temperament. Sometimes the patient might have a little bit more of an aggressive temperament than others, and we just have to know that individual patient. Sometimes that does happen. And because of personality changes that can occur with the disease, that sometimes can change the person's temperament a bit, so that can be part of it sometimes. Sometimes the reason that there's aggressive behavior is that there's another condition. Like you, you said, maybe there's pain somewhere. Maybe there's the arthritis is really acting up. There's been some really interesting studies recently about giving folks uh, mild painkillers like acetaminophen and your Advil or your Motrin uh, preventively for arthritis to reduce aggressive behavior. There's been some really interesting studies around that, just giving it to them preventively in the morning when they wake up because a lot of us are achy and it can contribute to us you know, having some aggressive behavior because we're not able to say, oh, my arthritis is acting up. But there could be something else physically going on. Ultimately, it's our job to figure out why is the aggressive behavior happening? Why are we acting out aggressively? Uh, the patient, why is the patient? Why is the patient acting out in this aggressive way? That's our job to figure out. We have to be a detective. So they are, might be trying to tell you because it's the only way that they can communicate with you. It's the only way they can tell you their story. They might be telling you something about the way they feel or their circumstances. These are the four keys. We need to be patient. We need to be empathic. We need to be flexible. And we need to be a detective. Being patient when you are taking care of somebody with Alzheimer's disease is very hard to do. Even professionals lose their patience, and that's why we take breaks. That's why we have three shifts in nursing homes and assisted livings. Being patient is a challenge. But it, think about the families you work with, that they have been doing it for five years with no other help. They are going to really struggle with patience sometimes. They're going to have a lot of false beliefs about the disease sometimes. Uh, you know what? She, she, she acts normally when my sister's here. It's just me that she... They, they think sometimes that, that that person can control some of these behaviors. So we want to be flexible. This is the time of year that a lot of people will ask me, what do you think about me taking my dad with Alzheimer's disease to Florida to visit his great grandkids? You guys are probably getting some of those questions this time of year. And we, of course, go through the pros and cons. And, but the bottom line is that I always say to every family is you can do it. You, you want to be realistic. How do you think he or she will do on the trip? plan, think about it, let's go through the scenarios. Is there a medical center nearby? Can the doctor give you maybe some prescription for the plane in case there's agitation? We go through all those details. But I say, be flexible. No, you might have to cancel the trip if your loved one gets a cold. Be flexible. If you're down there and things aren't going great, you may have to come home early. Be flexible. If you're at a celebration and there's 30 people at the dinner table, your loved one might become agitated. It might be that you need to leave the dinner a little bit early and go back to the hotel. Be flexible. A lot of people don't want to hear that. They want to go with what they want to plan. But being flexible, being empathic, we, they can't choose. If, if somebody with Alzheimer's disease could tell us, I am pretty convinced that every last one of them would say, yes, I would love to not have this disease. We have to have the empathy for them. 
they, they can't be where we are. We have to have empathy and we have to have that understanding. Be a detective. We want to be a detective. If you watch TV shows like Law and Order or any of that, sometimes you'll see, or you know, Lifetime movies where there's some kind of crime or something like that, you're going to see sometimes that the usual suspect is often the, the one that is the, the criminal, right, that, that purported the crime. But sometimes it's much deeper than that. There's a whole backstory. It's the same thing with dementia. Sometimes we're being a detective with dementia aggressive behavior, and <laughs> the answer is so right in front of us. And sometimes we have to dig really deep. So can, you guys are nodding. Do you have an example of when it's right in front of you? <laughs> yeah, the way that we reacted is what's causing the aggressive behavior. You walk in, Mr. Smith is masturbating. We, <gasps> and then they start act, the, the, Mr. Smith starts screaming and yelling, right? So the detective work is really simple. We have to stop overreacting. If we walk into the privacy of their room and they're masturbating, we, not, we need to not overreact. But sometimes it's a lot deeper than that. Sometimes, oh my gosh, she gets really agitated every day at lunch. What could it be? What could it? And what we find is that there is a woman sitting at her table that looks like her sister-in-law that she can't stand. <laughs> and we never, so it, it requires a lot of detective work. So sometimes it's, it's really easy to figure out and we sometimes overlook it, but sometimes we have to dig and we have to, sometimes it could be a siren. When somebody goes out to the hospital and maybe there's an ambulance coming up and the sirens, Sometimes that causes agitation. If you're in a room where there's the news on, and for a lot of people with dementia, they are viewing the television and they're believing that what they're seeing on the television is happening right then. She only gets upset in the common room at 6 p.m. And, and we've been thinking, oh, is she, is she feeling, does she have enough to eat? Is she really tired that she wants to go to bed? And eventually we figure out, you know what, she probably shouldn't watch a lot of news. So the detective work can be really, really simple, or it can be really take a long time. And sometimes you're never going to figure out what's causing the aggressive behavior. And then, of course, that's when you just start to treat it. But what we want to do as much as possible is prevent the aggressive behavior.